I just thought, poor chap, he's obviously in a bad way. At that point, we had no idea what he'd done. When the pager went off that day, it was about half past six in the evening. We were told that there was a report from two ships. There was a dinghy in the shipping lanes. It's quite in line with, with a typical small boat crossing in the channel. So straight away, um, assumptions were made that potentially that's, that's what we're going to. That shipping lane is extremely busy. There are huge ships that can't stop and may not be able to see that vessel um, and we need to get there quickly. It takes the crew 15 minutes to cover the four miles out to sea, where they immediately spot a tiny inflatable dinghy by a large container vessel on the edge of the shipping lanes. But as the crew draw nearer, they spot something unusual. This was a dinghy that was full of bags um, and just one person. He was laying on his back and he had a cycle helmet on, which was quite bizarre and in his hands he was holding a tiny sail and leaning back and trying to catch the wind, which is something I'd never seen before. Work that one out. That's his means of propulsion. When we tried to talk to him, he started to explain that he didn't want any help. You're in danger right now. In our opinion, you're in danger. The amount of equipment uh, and, and belongings that he had on board, it was considerably overloaded. So the concern is, is he going to get swamped, flipped over, uh, and sort of end up in, in the water himself? We can't leave him there. As well as being adamant that he doesn't want to get on the lifeboat, unlike every other small boat crossing the crew have attended, the casualty doesn't want to get to England either. No, I want to go to France. Obviously, we're typically dealing with taskings with small boats that are generally come in the other direction, it didn't add up. Well, I, I, I moved to France for asylum. You're going to France for asylum? Yeah. All right. At that point, he's refusing to come on board, and we at that point cannot actually leave the scene. It's really important in cases like this that we just remain calm, and it takes as long as it takes at the end of the day. But what finally convinced the casualty to come aboard was we was giving him straight facts about the weather, um, the course that he was drifting. The casualty finally agrees to come on board and the lifeboat begins heading back to Dungeness. I stayed and talked to him for a little while, trying to ask him a few questions, how he was. I just thought, poor chap, he's obviously in a bad way. At that point, we had no idea what he'd done. The crew settle in for a steady journey home, little realising that the man they have just rescued is the subject of a major manhunt. A 15-year-old has died and his mother is seriously injured after a stabbing at a house in Manchester. What, what I'm told by Great Manchester Police is that they're actively seeking him and they have quite rightly said, do not approach this individual, phone 999 and contact the police if you know of his whereabouts. Back at the station, Sarah and the rest of the shore crew pass the casualty's name and description onto the Coast Guard. As the boat was coming back with the man on board, I received a phone call at the station from the police. Uh, they were asking a lot of questions, the man's name, age. Once we were under the understanding that this man could potentially be dangerous, uh, my concerns were the safety of the crew. Though Sarah and the shore crew are now aware of the situation and that the police are inbound, there's no way they can warn the lifeboat crew without also potentially tipping off the suspect. We got back to station, disembarked from the boat. It was a straightforward, make the guy maybe a cup of tea if he wants one and uh, see if we can just warm him up a bit. He seemed very stressed at this point and he, he had become quite sweaty as well, like he was starting to sort of panic and, and maybe like at the look of worry across his face as such. Inside the station, Jason and Mark continue to talk to the casualty, utterly oblivious to what is now happening outside. A lot of big cars arrive very quickly and within a matter of a few minutes, there are about 10 to 15 officers with shields and guns. They were quite strategic in that they were able to do it without the man knowing that they were there. 
We weren't actually aware, sitting in the crew room, Jason, myself and the casualty, that the police were actually physically at the station. I got up out of my chair, said to the casualty, uh, I'll be back in a minute. I walked to the, the door with a glass panel on it and I could see uh, a whole line of armed police officers holding rifles. The moment Jason and Mark step out of the room, the police make their move. Go on, mate. Sort of one. put your hands up. Show me your hands. Okay, put your hands on your head. They make these sudden movements, all right? Hands on your head. Okay. Hands on your head. All right, mate, you're under arrest for murder and attempt murder. Once I'd learnt that he was uh, suspected of murder, you're able to start to make sense on how he was behaving. What? Let's go. Just I actually minute. thought, wow, I've actually stood next to this guy and patted him on the arm and tried to reassure him and, you know, help him, and then you actually feel quite angry. This shout particularly does highlight uh, the fact that you never know what that next shout is going to be when the pager goes. <laughs>